Thank you very much, Ron. Um, okay, so it's a privilege to be speaking to you all today. Uh, I will be speaking about uh, what is colloquially known as the Onshore Atlas Project in the Department of Energy, but this is a project that's driven by the uh, oil and gas potential in the Devona Carboniferous Basins from the, the energy question side, but given my background working with natural resources, most of the geoscience that needs to get done and, and to address the energy question also applies to the mineral and water resources and whatnot. And so what I'm really speaking to is a, a path I've been on now since I joined government here in Nova Scotia, which is that many of the questions that we're faced with are complex three-dimensional geoscience questions and we need to bring Nova Scotia uh, workflows and capacities into the realm where we integrate that information and it will really improve uh, our understanding and allow people to make better decisions. So since I made the move to the Department of Energy I've had to uh, grapple with a different perspective on geoscience and this is my personal idiot's guide to the to the energy the energy question that we're engaged in, and what, the way I look at it is that um, I put the economy as one axis and the environment as one axis. And essentially, when you look at sort of traditional energy sources that are resource based, um, they've really you know transformed the global economy. Um, but we're starting to realize that they have consequences just in a sort of unadulterated use, and so we're also now as a society and a species exploring um, other forms of energy and we probably live in a century where the traditional forms are going to be used less and, and the, the newer forms are going to be used more and how do we manage that transition in a way that makes sense for various jurisdictions and it's worth putting on, this is from the Nova Scotia Power website, this is a pie chart of the energy mix that uh, that Nova Scotia takes, and it's interesting to see that even in 2012, we were getting more than half of our energy from coal, 18% from natural gas, and we're still down at 18% here in terms of uh, the renewables. And we have a commitment to get this number up to 40% and to reduce our reliance on coal, and it really creates an opportunity here for some of the cleaner uh, energy sources, and this becomes where the potential in the onshore and the geoscience becomes an interesting problem to look at. It's also worth noting that recent actions have actually said in terms of onshore exploration that, that as, a, as a society we're potentially in Nova Scotia uncomfortable with uranium exploration, we're uncomfortable with shale gas exploration because we fear some of the environmental consequences. And so another angle of this research is also to address what is our real knowledge of the risks that are associated with, uh, with some of the strategies to uh, you know, change our energy mix. And you're probably all aware of some of these issues exploding onto the scene this year from Nova Scotia in terms of uh, whether we were going to allow hydraulic fracturing and the uh, Nova Scotia Independent Review led by uh, David Wheeler from the University of Cape Breton. Um, and one of the things that I want to highlight in here is they were tasked with assessing what our potential and what our risk is in the onshore basins. And the conclusion is in terms of the potential is that it is very difficult to quantify the potential or even to rank various basins because we don't actually know, have an integrated understanding of this, of this topic. And if we go on to some of the risks, the same idea is that although none of the potential negative impacts would be catastrophic, there are many outstanding questions. And so it's really talking to a knowledge gap. And that is where, uh, but the potential in terms of a resource just in the shale gas, and this is by no means the only oil and gas potential in the onshore basins, you know, is significant enough that it is certainly something that government still wants to look at and understand at a deeper level as we move forward. And so some of this gives the context in which uh, the onshore uh, Atlas project gets driven within the Department of Energy. The other thing that's happened is we've had an offshore play fairway analysis that took place sort of in conjunction with renewed interest in our offshore. And it's viewed as a, as a component of the success in terms of driving investment into the offshore. And this is a model, a sort of a model of the workflow that took place to actually get to it, in this case, just an estimate of actual what the resource might be in the offshore. And you can see that there's a long process of workflow, many loopbacks and many components. 
Um, and this is the model that we're using now for the onshore atlas, is that we've taken those main, those main steps in the offshore, and, I, and I've sort of reduced them to a four-year strategy here, where we start with actually trying to curate our data, because it turns out uh, natural resources is quite far ahead of uh, energy in terms of their geoscience organization. And so it's to bring the energy curation of their data up to a standard that allows it to really be integrated into interpretation. We're then going to actually look at the subsurface modeling and then the fluid modeling in terms of hydrocarbons. And then from here, we will actually be able to make some transparent estimates. And it's, these things, are I can see, are a little bit hard to read. But the basic thing to say is that our ambition is an order of magnitude different than the offshore play for analysis. In the offshore, they had over 10 million, and it's now been doubled again to, to update, to look at the geoscience from funding through the Department of Energy. Uh, probably over 100 people were actually involved in, in developing this. Um, and the complexity in terms of the tectonics and the geology is relatively simple in the offshore in that it deals with an extensional setting um, with some halokinesis added in after. Uh, whereas in the onshore, our, we're, we're going to be optimistically looking in the realm of a million or two dollars of funding for research. We're probably talking less than 10 uh, researchers when you actually sort of add it up. Or that'd be more than that, but in a ballpark of that. And then the geological complexity is actually um, much, much more sophisticated than in the offshore in that we have, we don't even necessarily have a firm understanding of the tectonic setting in which these basins formed. And they've had subsequent events of both shortening and further extension, as well as the halokinesis. But if we start and look at what's been done in the 2014 fiscal year, we've been focusing on data curation. Uh, we've had a project that we called Paper to Digital. There's a, a healthy portion of the information that still resides on paper. We're hoping to, by the end of the year, to be in a situation where if you want to get access to petroleum data, you don't have to go into the files and search out paper copies, and we're trying to bring it all into the digital realm. We've also had a, had a project, which I'm going to show a little bit about, with the well logs and the LAS file that accompany them and the seismic data and the SegWide to get a standardization interpretation base to actually allow this stuff to be integrated into interpretation. And we're looking very shortly, we're in conversation with uh, the Department of Natural Resources, the Geological Survey of Canada, um, and various companies to actually look at what sort of more GIS layers and things that we can curate to actually allow us to sort of build an, the integrated interpretation. And we're also in this year tackling some of the preliminary steps that we can do in parallel with this curation that are going to set up our, our geomodeling. And so we're commissioning some sub-basin reviews um, and people with experience. This is an opportunity for me to ask for feedback and help from anyone here in particular to, to step forward. We're actually going to, we're talking to try to develop some chronostratigraphic standards to allow this interpretation to be scalable. Um, and then this is a, an idea that's come out of this curation effort, which is the idea of, of producing a, a geo-interpretation workbook, which is actually a way to present all the data to geologists in the community prior to, say, its, its detailed interpretation so that people can develop their own exploration ideas. So I'm just going to con concentrate in detail on um, a little bit about what these things actually look like. So if we look at the... Uh, we called it a data cleaning project, but essentially it was a standardization and organization project. And um, Agile Geoscience uh, won the contract for this, and Evan Bianco was the lead. I, I should say that if we are successful in uh, getting our funding for the next few years, that there are contract opportunities here for the geoscience community at large, and especially in Nova Scotia based. And I would advocate that there's, we have a, Nova Scotia government has a standing offer co contracting services, uh, standing offer contract, and we have to go through that first. So contractors that are on that list, we send out all of these contracts to at least three, three uh, companies to bid on the work. And so this is a, I mean, the opportunity is not huge, but it, it does exist and there are opportunities. But so in, in any case, what Evan did is we decided to follow the lead of the provincial geology map and look at the Devono Carboniferous in sort of three aggregate basins. Um, so there's all sorts of sub-basins within this in terms of colloquial terminology, but just sort of three regional areas that have some common elements. 
Within that, this is what the LAS data file looked like. This is a scorecard of all of the data that would be on file if you were to have come into our offices six months ago. You would have found du hundreds of duplicate types of data you wouldn't, of various kinds and vintages and of different depths in different files, very disorganized, very difficult to interpret. What Evan did was first he classified and just, just characterized the metadata associated with all of this. He then split out and streamlined all of these things to build uh, common data sets in the sort of different classes of petroleum signals that tell us different things about, about the subsurface geology. We then we end up with a sort of standardized scorecard for different uh, petroleum wells. And from this, we then developed, he, he picked the best, in his view, for interpretation purposes. If you don't want to go into all the data, here's the sort of top pick for each of the main categories of uh, information in terms of what you're going to actually get about lithology or, you know, is it filled with different kinds of fluid and whatnot. And so we then have these well uh, interpretation uh, depictions of the well logs that now for all of the petroleum wells in the province. And we went the additional step for those wells with sonic logs that allow us to actually take the uh, depth data and convert it to a time domain and velocity model. We now have synthetics developed for all of the, the models and so we're now sort of in the, at the stage where we can start looking at a depth conversion for our seismic data. In terms of our seismic data, we basically um, you know, I gave Evan full license to come up with a naming scheme for our, our SegWi data so that we can actually have unique names. We preserve all of the existing names, but rather than having, say, eight surveys with window one, we have, we, we actually identify it by both the, the survey and the year, the, um, the general uh, description within the survey name, and then we also have identified the vintage. It turns out that we have on file, again, a whole bunch of different versions of the seismic, and so now we've actually give, provided the metadata and organization for those different versions, so if people want to look at it, they know exact, what they're looking at in terms of what's on file. This is just an example of two different vintages with a different phase of, of processing, and you can see that you probably are going to want to look at the different images as they carry different degrees of information and filtering. The other thing that we did is these light red lines, which are actually under to some extent, these dark red lines all over the province. This was a GIS file that was prepared by, I think, Jeff McKinnon uh, in the mid of the last decade that looked at all of the planned seismic survey routes um, that were going to be done. But what we were, what I was able to do just this fall was to write a script that actually talks to the actual SegY data that we have on file and reads out the navigation. And so the dark red lines are actually auto-generated GIS that is reading in the navigation from the actual files. And there is a discrepancy between them, and so we're able to sort of see and explore what that means. In some cases, what's in the data itself is more reliable. In some cases, the original track data is more reliable. But what this auto-reading ability has allowed us to do as well is we're now able to populate uh, a set of attributes for each of these surveys and SegWi <coughs> files that actually tells you the frequency with which it was shot at uh, the number of trace points and, and some, some basic data. We can expand this based on needs of the feedback from the community now. And this is something that if we get a new survey shot, for example, there's a, a carbon sequestration seismic survey that's being shot in Cape Breton, we should be able to add this in, press a button, and it gets added to the whole system, you know, right from the get-go. And as well, where all of these seismic lines cross, we've actually got a simple, an estimate now I won't get into the technical details, but this is a, a sort of mistie estimate of to what degree are the seismic lines as they intersect actually potentially out of line vertically. Um, this is based on depth. It, the number varies depending on what depth you pick, and it depends on your geological picks. But these circles give you a sort of very visual estimate of what kind of error you might have to smooth in terms of your geological interpretations. And then this was just a mock-up at the end of this project about what a, a sort of atlas type presentation of this information might be able to look like coming down the road is where you put some of these things together, you link it to the surface. So if we look at that in terms of the standardization, we've done this sort of the GIS, the metadata, and we also have a set of patrol interpretation projects now set up with all of the seismic for those three regions. Um, the things to do is one of the things that 
is ambiguous at the Department of Energy is the sharing and public dissemination policies. I'm a real advocate of sharing this data and making it transparent and available. In some cases, we in energy and with specifically with SegWi data, we have to be conscious that there are business models built around selling this data. And so some of that needs to be worked out. But the goal is to create ways to share the data and allow the geology to develop over top of it. And as well, we've identified numerous um, miscellaneous issues of data that's lying in different places. There's a St. George's survey that's sitting in a CNSOPB facility in, 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 in Dartmouth. There's a new survey coming, and all of these things need to be continually integrated into this thing. But we now have a workflow for our curation of the basic petroleum data. Um, this other project is just, I'm just in the process of getting this on the go. Um, this is taking those three basins. Uh, I've phoned around the community and tried to identify people with the time and interest to actually take a, a state, a sort of a state of 2015 state look at what the literature has said about these basins in terms of their geological setting and context, which is what anyone would need now to start forward with interpretation. Um, the idea is that we that we would have these three basic papers. John Waldron, who I suspect many of you know, has signed on to take charge of a Cumberland and region basin. Um, I still owe maps for this area to DNR, and in the process of making those maps, I've t I'm taking on this sort of the mainland Nova Scotia basin, and then I'm in the process of negotiating with the Geological Survey of Canada to see if we can get Peter Giles, who spent much of the time mapping some of the maps of the last sort of 30 years for the Antigua Cape Breton regions. And this is to set the stage for a comprehensive new 3D interpretation of these basins in 2015 and 16. I'm also in discussion with um, Brendan Murphy, is I think the sort of science editor of Geoscience Canada. And the venue that we're gonna try to create for this is an open access special series in the, in the Geological Association of Canada journal. At the moment, we're targeting these three base papers, but I'm hoping once this picture gets clarified that we can actually extend this to New Brunswick and Newfoundland, and maybe there's other angles and other topics that we can solicit authors for to make this a, re a truly robust early uh, look at a sort of synth synthesized view of the geoscience. And, it, and we're talking with potential people who aren't interested maybe in, in participating in some of this work, but are definitely open to providing peer review and oversight of, of what comes out of this, and certainly all the staff of, of natural resources are gonna be invaluable in this process. Um, and I thought I would just think, one of the things that's come out of this look at all the data is this idea that we might wanna create an interpretation workbook. And so right now I've been sort of working on how feasible this is, um, and then it, once we have a feasibility sort of worked out, we would probably put this out as a contract to the community. Um, just to show you the kinds of things we're looking at is that if you look at the, this is a, a paper that John Waldron in 2010 made looking at the windsor Kennecook Basin, and we have, you know, the, this, the, the geological map that we're familiar with, where we've got some faults here, and I just draw your attention to this Rodden Fault, which is drawn along here, and you'll see that it's got younger next to older in one direction here, and older next to younger in the other direction here. So there are some complexities and, and ambiguities about whether these actually make sense, whether these are the right interpretations, and the best way to tackle this is to look at the subsurface. Now, um, and this is the same, this is actually a map that a student of mine when I was at DNR, we made, and we've actually interpreted a, a sort of thrust through here, but to actually track it along this sort of perfect line is probably not right as well, and it needs the subsurface information to make the adjustments to have a detailed model, and this has all, lots of mineral implication because because of the uh, base, uh, some of the mineralization that's associated with these main structures. And what I wanted to show you was one of the seismic lines. This is also taken from the John Waldron paper. You can kind of see, I'm hoping, a sort of major fault has been interpreted through here. And this is the interpretation that John made. But what's, what happens when you are just working in Petrel and interpreting seismic is it's not set up easily to do the surface integration. And if you're just working with surface data, it's not set up easily to work with the subsurface data. And so if we look at that fault, and you'll have to trust me on this, it actually comes out that, that it's crossing that line down here, and there's a major fault in the seismic interpretation that isn't on the geological map, and, and these types of things are, are out of sync. And so what the interpretation workbook, the idea that we're looking at is this is the same region, and what I've done is I've basically 
taken a track, you know, you create a auto-generate lines, cross-section lines running down the basin, and I've picked them so that they're pretty close to the seismic data. And then you have a digital elevation model at the top of this as an example data set, as well as you have that ge the surface geology map. And what we're doing is we're auto-going along and we're, we're taking the seismic data of a nearby survey and projecting it onto the section line and we're adjusting it with the elevation data, which we're showing the, the more detailed profile up here for interpretation. And we're also color coding the geology from the surface map. And the idea is that we would add in magnetic surveys and whatnot. And once this whole workflow is developed, the idea is that we could actually take these kinds of interpretation sections and interpret them and get our surface map and subsurface interpretation working together and in sync. And so you go along these different sections And one of the things that I'm trying to set up in terms of presentation, that fault that I was showing you earlier, we can see where it comes up. We, we can actually say it's a certain kilometer distance along the section line. And then when we go to look at the map, we can actually see that it lines right along the Kennecook River, which all of this is showing is a major fault and a major structure in the basin that's not been ever appeared on any, any map. Anyway, I'll move on. We're almost at lunchtime here. So the idea is that this workbook is not going to be the interpretation itself. We will be working towards our interpretation, our maps, but the idea is that an explorationist, whether you're in the mineral or the petroleum sector, can take this data and draw your own interpretations on, your, your own prospects, your own interpretations, and that it would allow these multiple exploration strategies. It's going to allow our bedrock geology maps that we're going to be developing in collaboration with DNR, uh, or that they're developing, but that we can collaborate on with this with incorporating this data um, to have these integrated as well as this type of input, this cross-sectional input is actually a standard input to many of the geomodeling software as we go towards 3D. Um, and just a comment on, on the, the effort to get to 3D, currently as, as I understand it, the Nova Scotia government is still working on a comprehensive 2D GIS strategy across government. We're still discussing things like site licenses for you know, basic software. And we're not really looking at the question of what is our geomodeling strategy in, in this sense. This was true at my time at DNR, and it's true in, in energy. But some of the things that are crystallizing is that there are some other global surveys that are way ahead of us on this front that have actually collaborated with various software companies to develop some, some software that really would allow us to step in. These software are developed not just for petroleum applications, but also for mineral and hydrogeological, environmental. So there's a comprehensive strategy here that could come out, out of this. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, as, as long as money is an obstacle to getting into some of this stuff, I'm actually exploring uh, the open source uh, software that doesn't have a, a, a financial cost, but does have a, a knowledge penalty to use, OBSPY is a great new library for that I'm using to read all of the data to generate some of these outputs. And also the other obstacle is the artificial uh, jurisdictions. What you discover when you get into these topics is that, you know, bedrock geology, fluid geology, hydrocarbons, offshore, onshore, we have a lot of different jurisdictions in how we manage this uh, as a civil service, both federally, provincially with the CNSOPB. But this is an example of an interpretation from the sub Laurentian project that was just part of the most recent offshore call for bids. And you see that the Maritimes Basin, the Carboniferous, is actually underlying the offshore systems. And so we need to have, we need to bridge the gap between land-based and, and sub-ocean geoscience so that we can actually start to have a comprehensive understanding as well. Um, and then we're envisioning that we can get towards an integrated atlas, at least for the Devona Carboniferous driven by the energy question, but this could spread to other topics, I'm sure. Um, just to review, this is the sort of outline that we're looking at. We're at the data curation stage and getting set for the geomodeling. And there is some will, if you read the tea leaves, there's some will to make some potentially relatively significant investment moving forward uh, to make, some, make this happen so that we, you know, our politicians can make educated decisions and, and relay that to the public and it's be transparent so that it can all be evaluated and judged accordingly. And again, this is, this is the situation that we're in. This, these are not topics that we can just look away from. They, they could play a, a real role in how Nova Scotia progresses. Uh, natural gas, by, for example, we've invested a lot in a natural gas infrastructure. My understanding is that it, at current trends, we're not that far away from 
becoming a net importer of natural gas, and that would actually change a lot of dynamics, both in terms of whether industries want to come up and set up here and whatnot. And so exploration for natural gas could have a real benefit. Some of these technologies, they might not be our future in 50 to 100 years, but they could be give us the money to actually invest in the onshore, off, the, the renewable side, so we can see these as a, com, as a complementary strategy. Um, yeah, so it's, this at, at the moment is being driven by the energy question, resources and risks, but there's real collaborative value and I'm really hoping that anyone in the audience that wants to speak to me about something I'm missing, steps I need to take, I would really like to hear that. Um, I'd also like to say that this is part of a broader vision. The Atlas type project is really based about the synthesis and interpretation of existing or old data, but we're also looking at the possibility of some new baseline data initiatives where we're looking at the collection of useful and affordable new data and the sort of hot topics that are circulating in terms of this is whether it's feasible to do some uh, relatively high precision gravity surveys, whether we can do link in the base and trace metal geochemistry which turns out to have an indication of hydrocarbon passage as well there's some but would also have application for the mineral industry micro seep surveys where we're actually looking for surface indications of fluids coming up from below and as well i think that the lidar capacity as well that you know, i was really keen to see tim's talk this morning because i think that high resolution dem you know, has a lot of geological impact and will really apply to some of this and whether we can come up with money to fly a survey or not would be fun. Uh, and as well, the, the third part of all of this is that one of the things that came out of the Wheeler Report is that community engagement is central to how we go forward with this data, how we present it, and that's a part of the overall strategy. And I'll just leave it there. And I'm sure everybody's hungry. Sorry for... <laughs>